solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. I had some thoughts of military in, in, in high school and went to college because it was what was supposed to be done. It was pretty clear after a year that if I wasn't going to do college, it was pretty clear after a year, I didn't need to do college. I didn't necessarily know what I was going to do, uh, but, but college was not going to happen. And then I remember your first question, which was why or how did I get into submarines? And I, I had the option. Once I discovered the Navy nuke program, you find out whether well, either on board carriers, which are floating cities of 5,000 ish people, or they're on submarines, which are super small communities. And there was something about the small community that just drove me towards submarines. It had nothing to do with the space. It was purely about the number of people I was going to be with. And I guess knowing all their faces and names and having an effect, it was more visible in a crew of 150 versus five. I uniquely knew that was going to be my only contract, I think, before I even got to my boat. And I wasn't shy about being honest about that, which was good and bad, but I never, once I was in the military, I never saw it as a career. I always wanted to utilize it as the best stepping stone possible after screwing up the traditional path that you're supposed to do. Okay. Gotcha. And so you always knew and you communicated that and was it hard for you? I know when I was telling people uh, it's time for me to get out, people were like, really, do you really want to do that? Cause I, I had some medical stuff where I was on the fence and it was like, they're like, you can fight this or you can just let the winds take you where they will. And when I said, I'm just going to let this play out, people were like, well, why don't you fight it? Like, why don't you stay in, think about X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. So what was it like for you dealing with all of those thoughts when you're talking about, Hey, like, this is it for me. Yeah. It went both ways and it depended on who I was speaking with. I think the honest peer to peer conversations with other Navy nukes inside the engineering department were pretty much no hassle, super smooth, understand it at the time you could reenlist for anywhere from 70 to $95,000 reenlistment bonus. Um, and so you had a lot of people that would star reenlist automatically put on E5, um, and extend for two years and just get a, a nice paycheck for the next two years and the way they divvy it up. Um, so the incentives were definitely there. So saying no to them, you were in the minority. It was like, well, what do you mean? You don't want 80 grand or you're not, it's only two more years, dude. So those on the engineering side, pretty open and honest and easy. And most people understood it was the non-engineering E7s and up like the chief of the boat or the other chief duty officer that day. Who's just trying to, to BS with you and have some fun and being like, Hey, Aaron, when are you reenlisting? And you're just like, I'm not chief. They're like, well, what do you mean? You're not, I don't know. I'm not. So they. Sometimes I think they were surprised by my openness of not wanting to reenlist, but I also maintained a really good work ethic and professionalism throughout my entire contract as well. It's not like I wasn't doing my job or planning to get out. I was in a lucky spot to really never question getting out. However, I will say I'm right at that point where I spent six years in the military and coming up in about a month, it'll be six years out of the military and the structure and the professionalism and the good parts about the military, they're unmatched and in my experience unseen, um, since I've been out. So you do miss it but I was never worried about losing it and I'm still not sad that it's gone, but you definitely compare it and have it as a metric and uh, it's true, pure machinery with human form and it's very efficient and it's very matter of fact. And it, it is 
easy. There, there is an ease of putting on the same uniform every single day, wearing the same thing, going to the same place, working with the same people, having a literal plan of the day that's broken down by 15 minute increments. Um, and I haven't even come close to matching the stability or the rigor of the Navy since getting out of it. It's on purpose, but I haven't even come close. I think I had an extremely unrealistic view of changes that could be made and how fast they could be made. And I wanted more efficiency and more better good stuff to keep it simple out of that business. And we'll ultimately discover that the military has truly perfected the human aspect of it or at least made it very simple. And in the civilian world, the human element is so much more of a variable um, where you don't know who you're going to make mad. You don't know whose toes you're going to step on. And this is me coming in with good intentions and good thoughts that were pushed people the wrong way. And that was certainly unexpected, essentially getting told, hey, I have an idea that I think could make your life easier and getting told to shut up and get back on the phone, do your job, um, was interesting. But I still struggle with turning off as far as work and objectives and goals and missions and outcomes. So it's, it's definitely a recalibration, man, like full throttle. When you're going full throttle in the military for real, if you're preparing for a mission or on mission or doing a exam or an ORS, full throttle there compared to a civilian corporation who has a deadline of this Friday for something full throttle and in my opinion, night and day, like not even close. How did you learn to start dealing with that new human element that you hadn't had to, you didn't have to consider when you were in the service? Yeah, the truth is I'm still learning, but my biggest thing is I try and focus on transparency and I think one of the biggest difference between the, the military and civilians when it comes to transparency is in the military, it runs from A to Z. And in the civilian world, it stops with conflict or uncomfortableness. Whereas we're able to push through that in the military of, hey, you messed up this part of the procedure and we could just let it go and not say anything. But unfortunately, you got to go stand in front of the captain and we're doing this. You got shocked. You could have hurt somebody, blah, blah, blah. Those were called critiques in the engineering department. And we had dozens upon dozens of critiques and every single one was very formal, very the same way. What did you do? How did you do it? Where did you mess up? Why did we mess up? What do we do next time to not mess up? And the confrontation aspect on the civilian world, it tends to, it's like pure good transparency and then it just halts. And it stops when it gets to that uncomfortableness sometimes. And that can be with clients. It can be during the interview processes. It can be with peers. It can be with bosses. So I think trying to put yourself in a position where you want to be open and honest and share what you're feeling in a professional way, you have to force that even if the, the door seems to be shut. So if that happens, I feel like we have to be the squeaky wheel to like, all right, I haven't heard back from this. I'm sending that follow-up email and I'm going to be pretty specific. But again, it is, it's a tough situation still. Yeah. How do you think veterans, how do you think people who are getting out of the military can mentally prepare themselves to start dealing with that new human element that they aren't necessarily prepared to deal with? How do they prepare for the human element? I guess you gotta be prepared to understand that what you say might be taken more personally than it's ever been said. And again, that's hard. 
I won't say it on the podcast, but after this, you should ask me the last email I got from my Navy chief. Like, it's just, to me, it's one of the funniest things in the world. But if it went to anyone else, um, you know. So how do you prepare for the civilian aspect? Man, I don't know. Look inward a little bit too. Sometimes the problem is us or we're more of an aspect of it than we give ourselves credit for. Make sure we're not presenting that old grouchy, crabby, salty veteran and that we're not going in with alpha egos and chest held high and beaten chest and we're going to come in and dominate this place. Again, be respectful and understand that you're coming into someone else's environment and home. And ultimately, this is, I'm assuming, going to be a career that if it's not going to be yours forever, it's going to launch you to your next stepping stone. And just because there's no contract holding you there doesn't mean the respect and authority or respectfulness shouldn't be there, even if they're not the ones showing it. Like we're the example setters. We know, I think more often than not, we know what should be done, regardless of if there's a policy for it or not. But I don't know. Be prepared to walk away. Don't let anger get a hold of you. Don't, res- if, if someone pisses you off in an email, don't respond right away. Like I always let things settle. Um, I think simple questions instead of assumptions can help a lot of the time. Let's say you get an email that you think pisses you off instead of saying, well, hey, Sean, that was really mean. I don't appreciate that. Be like, Sean, hey, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding this email. Let's hop on a five minute phone call and let's figure this out. But there's just, there's so many emotions in the civilian world. There are so many emotions all over the place from teams of five to companies in the tens of thousands. And again, that's something that the military somehow maintains without it even being a forward focus. Like we never really thought about, I didn't never really thought about that. I go, I got to worry about making my peer mad or stepping on their toes or doing their job better than them, that was rewarded in the military. In fact, doing your job bad was sometimes a reward. We used to call it hookups for F-ups because they want to be trusted with anything, right? So they would be the tool getters or the briefers or the, the runners, whereas the more competent people would be the ones with the hands in the machines. What do you think you've done to, do you think you've done a good job of building a life outside of work um, now that you're out of the military after it consumed you so much in the service. Yeah, but it also takes a lot of work too, right? Um, I think it's that people element again, right? There's an aspect of, oh man, every time I text this friend, they're busy or this friend text me too much. I text this friend too much. So again, the social element of it is there. One thing I've struggled with since getting out is realizing that you don't have to be friends with everyone in the military. There's no choice. So you're completely professional and competent with someone who you like literally dislike, but I stand behind what I said earlier. Even that person who I disliked seven years ago on the boat could still call me tonight and have a place to sleep. So it's something that is is a lot of work, but I think it's well worth it. I love having friends that are not direct military friends or forced friends inside of people and how I've been able to do that. We work, I've met quite a few people at just social networking events that we work. Bunker Labs has been a really good one, but that's more kind of friends that are spread out all over the place, kind of digital friends. And then just Asking friends of friends, hey, people, I just moved to Denver. Who do you know in Denver? And getting like blind friend dates is what I call it. If you knew someone in Denver and you're like, Brandon, you got to go hang out with David. David and I would go hang out and there's a pretty good likelihood that we would both at least be neutral with each other. So making friends is definitely important, but it is another, it's another aspect of life that I didn't have time for in the military. My family was my division. Again, when you work, when you truly work over a hundred hours a week for years straight, it all gets blurry. Going back to the military thing, you had some level of stability and you chose to leave anyway, based off of your convictions or goals that you had set for yourself. And what do you think you have that allows you to do that? Uh, 
being debt free is certainly part of it, right? Like having a low financial burden, um, I think has made a lot of this possible. If I was six figures in debt, like a lot of college graduates or a new homeowner with an 8% interest rate, like it would definitely be difficult. So, so lifestyle has helped, but again, the lifestyle was premeditated to allow this. So I think one thing about setting goals is you have to be okay with failure. You also have to be okay with pivoting. And I think that's where a lot of the problem happens is we're our own worst critic sometimes and we'll beat ourselves up. But my challenge to that is since your last goal setting session, I highly believe that the chances that you have acquired more knowledge since then are high. So it's not that you're changing you are reassessing and pivoting based on information that was unavailable when you made it the first time. So you shouldn't be accomplishing every single goal that you check and they should be specific, measurable, attainable, time bound. But you also have to give yourself the grace and the empathy that you're going to give a stranger to yourself and say, man, I was maybe overzealous in these goals or these goals were unrealistic based on this, like still learn from them, dude. But as far as higher one goals, I don't think I've truly accomplished or hit a home run with any higher one goals I've set in over three years, but I sit down and I reassess and I learn and I rinse, wash and repeat while still slowly, but surely moving forward. I think persistence is a big key to success and not making the same mistake twice. Make mistakes all you want, but don't make the same mistake. You have to know what your end goal is, because if you truly can crystallize and visualize your end state, it makes the decision-making process much more clear. And what I mean by that is every decision I make that's involved in my professional, personal Mm -hmm. life goes through a filter of my end goal. And I put it through a very simple filter of positive, neutral, negative. So my filter is, would this decision be a positive, a neutral, or a negative? And then a lot of the times, if it's a neutral to positive, the answer is yes. If it's a neutral to negative, it's let's get more information and consider this. But crystallizing your end goal, and again, mine is a debt-free, active, dad with a um, sustainable income from multiple different sources that is extremely maintainable. Like it's nothing, like I'm not looking to make $3 million a year. A 10th of that would be pretty, pretty okay. So I think crystallizing your end goal will help you when you have to make a tough decision. Do I take this job? Do I not take this job? Do I go on this vacation or not go on this vacation? Do I move here? Do I not move here? What hobbies do I pick up? How much extendable income do I have? When do I want to retire? Where do I want to retire? And these are tough things to think of and it's okay if they change, but cementing them in your current uh, mental state and allowing yourself to have flexibility in it, um, I think definitely helps when you have to make the 50-50 calls or the calls that you're truly not sure. Hey, everybody. I really hope that you liked this supercut of the post-military podcast. If you did and you want to see more, I would recommend that you check out the whole episode, which is here on YouTube and also on multiple different podcasting platforms. If you like this and you want to support the channel, I would ask that you give the video a like, subscribe, and uh, share the content with those who might need to hear it. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you in the next episode. Peace.